we are going to discuss an approach to ventilator alarms and also those special cases with ventilators that are particularly risky for patients, the moments where we want to avoid the clean kill. And so we're going to talk through a couple of these special cases that you may come across, uh, and then I'm going to give you my approach to ventilator alarms. Uh, don't be put off uh, about the vent alarms. I know people in general hate this topic, but this is the easiest approach you'll ever find, uh, and I think it'll help you feel a lot more confident. So let's launch into our first case. You have an elderly patient who presents to your emergency department with COPD. Their hypoxia is quite severe, so you move to intubating them and you do a rapid sequence intubation and you set your initial settings for the patient. And actually, you're very proud of yourself because you haven't just intubated, you've also set the ventilator yourself. And you're walking away to call the ICU or to write your note or to pat yourself on the back. Uh, but then the patient has a PA arrest within a couple minutes of your intubation. Guys, what's your approach to this patient? What are you going to do first? CPR. I intubated their their esophagus. Oh yeah, so I'm going to bag them up. You're going to bag their esophagus up? No, I'm going to bag that. I'll take out the <laughs> ET tube or look to see it's there and try bagging them up. Okay, so you're going to check that your endotracheal tube's in place. That's pretty legit. Paul's starting ACLS. I would do that too. And so, in general, for these people, I am starting ACLS. I'm checking where the tube is. For any patient who has a cardiac arrest, I will take them off the ventilator. The ventilator is just too difficult for us to manage in terms of our cognitive load during a cardiac arrest. So just manually bag to make it easier for yourself and turn off the vent so it can't alarm all throughout your arrest. And then you want to think through your differential diagnosis for these patients. I have a short list of things that cause the COPD patient to have that peri-intubation arrest. Do you guys have anything on your list for this? What are you thinking about in this patient? Popped a lung. Popped a lung. That's a good one. Yeah. Well, I already said the only one knows the tube is in the wrong place. <laughs> that's fair. I think that's definitely in, fair. in fact, we checked your tube. Your tube's yes. in the right place. So All your right. intubation was solid and you can still pat yourself on the back. And so the things I'm thinking about are one, hypovolemia or vasodilation. Often these people come in a little dry to start with, and then they may have vasodilation from whatever medications we've used in our induction. They could also have dynamic hyperinflation, which we're gonna talk about in just a second, or pneumothorax, as Paul mentioned. So can we dig into dynamic hyperinflation for a second? This is also known as auto peep or um, breath stacking is the other term for it, and it can get confusing because there are so many terms. But this occurs when you have your COPD patient who needs a long time to exhale. And if the vent is blowing in air too fast, that exhalation time can be inadequate. They don't have as much time as they need to fully exhale and empty their lungs. And what happens is they have increasing breath stacking, their lungs expand and expand, the pressure gets higher until it impairs their venous return and can lead to poor cardiac output and in fact, PEA arrest. And this is a special circumstance that we want to remember with these COPD patients. And so when I am managing the COPD arrest, I will alter my approach a little bit to make sure I'm covering these things off. And it's specifically, I'm thinking about dynamic hyperinflation, hypovolemia and pneumothorax in addition to my normal H's and T's. Sir, so on the last slide, you put a uh, respiratory rate is too fast. Is that because it's going so fast that they don't have, again, a, that chance for full expiration? Exactly. Okay. And what I mean by that is that the setting of the respirator on the ventilator is too fast for them. So you because at this stage, they're not rate. breathing on their slow own. You want to slow that vent respirate down so they have all the time they need to exhale. Okay. That reminds me of like you were highlighting the difference between your typical lung protective strategy, which we'll use for most patients, but then there's a very specific category, the obstructive, because you want to maximize that exhalation time. Exactly. And with these obstructive patients, you're going to start them at a lower respirate to begin with, maybe a respirate around 10 or even 8 for some patients, but you can still end up with dynamic hyperinflation over time, and you wanna be on the lookout for that in these patients who have a PEA arrest. Can we also put the asthmatics into this? I know we don't wanna typically intubate our asthmatics because we get into this trouble, but can you pretty much say COPD slash asthma for this patient? Absolutely, yeah. and I would manage either of those groups the same way and be worried about dynamic hyperinflation in either of them. Got it. Awesome. So when you're starting to manage this arrest, as we mentioned, we're gonna take these patients off the ventilator, but then I will not bag them 
for 20 seconds. And this will feel like the longest 20 seconds of your life. It's actually, I usually try to get somebody to look at the clock or set a little timer because otherwise two seconds go by and I think it's been 20 and I start bagging again. Now, during this time, when they are disconnected and you're not bagging, we're doing CPR, which is pressing on the chest and actively helping them exhale. That 20 seconds with CPR is going to fully empty their lungs And if the original problem was dynamic hyperinflation, they should rapidly get their preload back and they will get return of spontaneous circulation, often within that first cycle of CPR. So this is something that can be rapidly fixed by holding the bagging and making sure we're actively deflating the lungs. I think that's such an important point because the natural tendency with everyone on the team is like everyone's doing their job and you're focused on trying to run the code RT's at the bedside or someone's there and like the natural tendency is always going to be just a bag because you they're arrested so you need to oxygenate and so you're just going to be pushing it and everyone goes a mile a minute and this is like one of those times where and I, I mean in all fairness RT's too I think they're also aware of this and so we all just want to be on the same page to communicate that this is a COPD or asthmatic patient I'm concerned about this can we try this out because otherwise everyone's just going a mile a minute. Yeah, and when you do start bagging after the 20 seconds, maybe you want to be mindful to bag slow right. or slower than you would for your average patient because we know they need that long expiratory yeah. phase. Okay, and so in terms of the hypovolemia, we're bolusing fluids or using a push presser. In the arrest situation, we're giving epi typically, so that's the ultimate push presser at high doses in cardiac arrest. And for pneumothorax, my personal approach is that I'll do bilateral finger thoracostomies. We don't tend to do needles at our place because there have been um, mispositioning of the catheter. And I just would put in a caveat here that in the midst of a cardiac arrest, it is very hard to auscultate for bilateral breath sounds. Somebody's doing CPR, somebody's bagging up top, there's talking in the rooms, there are alarms going. It can be really hard to hear. And it's also a tough time just to do ultrasound to look for lung sliding. So if you have any doubt, put your finger in both sides of the chest. Do not call this a rest without being 100% certain that there is no pneumothorax that you've missed. And I just want to highlight the finger thoracostomy. Do you mind explaining a little bit what that means, if if that terminology might be unfamiliar? Absolutely. So, um, so one option for pneumothorax is to put a, an angiocath to do a needle decompression, and we usually use a 14 gauge angiocath, a midclavicular line, second intercostal space. The challenge with that is they don't always adequately drain the pneumothorax, and they can be kinked or mispositioned. So when we're doing a finger thoracostomy, we start as if you're doing your normal chest tube procedure. We make a scalpel incision over the rib, usually uh, fifth intercostal space, uh, and we'll bluntly dissect. We'll pop through the pleura with the Kelly, and then you put your finger into the pleural space to be sure you're in the right spot. And if they do have a pneumothorax, you're getting your whoosh of air at that stage. Uh, And we'll cover that with a Heimlich valve or a little dressing. We will put a chest tube in it, but often later after the arrest is over. just want to make sure the chest is fully decompressed and if I have my finger in that pleural space I can be a hundred percent confident that I've decompressed whatever is there. In the setting of arrest when you're doing the finger thoracostomy that means that you don't need to get the chest tube set up and the kid and like the the pleural vac it's just the scalpel Kelly's if you have them and you're just popping through with a finger and that's it. Both exactly sides. so it's fast you need minimal gear keeps it easy at the bedside. Got it. Awesome. And so I would still be doing the rest of my normal ACLS algorithm and thinking through my H's and T's, but these things are at the top of my list and they are the first things I want to address in this patient. And so let's review for a second. For any patient who arrests while they are on the ventilator, take them off the vent and bag them manually, just makes it easier for you to concentrate on running that arrest. And for the COPD patient who has a peri-intubation arrest, make sure you're thinking about dynamic hyperinflation, not bagging for 20 seconds, fixing hypovolemia or vasodilation, and checking hard, if not empirically treating, for pneumothorax. Okay, so let's move on to our second case. 
And this is a case of severe metabolic acidosis. And these are tricky patients. We can get into trouble with ventilators here, which is why I wanna highlight it for you. And guys, you will have heard people say, you know, don't intubate the DKA patient or don't intubate the aspirin overdose. Why do people say that? Uh, just like case one, clean kills. <laughs> clean kills, baby. They, they have to breathe really, really, really fast to breathe off their CO2 and we're not matching it. Awesome. If they're paralyzed, they're, they can't breathe at all. You're right, and then they're no longer compensating. So let's walk through this in a case to make sure it's clear for everybody. So this is a case of a 28-year-old female who presented to the emergency department with shortness of breath and vomiting. She had actually been short of breath for a few days with a fever and a cough, and she had a past medical history of insulin-dependent diabetes. And so when we first had a look at her, she was actually quite drowsy and a little bit confused. She was tachycardic with a borderline blood pressure and a respirate of 30, not the best sat, 87, so we put her on some oxygen, and a temperature of 37.7. We got initial lab work back on her, which showed a glucose of 450, a really low bicarb of three. Your bicarb should normally be around 24, so this was strikingly low. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. And anion gap is high. So she has an anion gap metabolic acidosis with a high glucose. And so, guys, what would you make as your presumptive diagnosis here? DKA. DKA, right? It's not really a mystery. And her chest x-ray showed a pneumonia and we thought, well, maybe the pneumonia has precipitated all of this illness and she's presenting to us now with DKA. And so we started our initial management for sepsis and DKA. We were giving her crystalloid. We started on an insulin infusion. And throughout this, we got uh, a gas back. And this was her initial ABG. So pHs that start with sixes are always terrifying. <laughs> Personally, I like numbers that start with seven, right? A normal pH is 7.4. So once you get down into the sixes, you're getting into critically acidotic patients. She's a PCO2 of 24. So she is blowing down her PCO2. Our normal should be 40. This means she's taking big breaths and blowing off more CO2. And she's trying to compensate for that bicarb of three. She also has a huge base excess. So this gas made us pretty worried. Uh, and we started to think about how we could increase our resuscitation for this lady. And just as we're talking about it at the bedside, she vomits and aspirates copious amounts of... Vomitus. Yes. We probably don't need to describe, in fact, <laughs> what it looked like because nobody needs that. Uh, but needless to say, there was a lot of it. And then there was a collective groan. <laughs> and, yeah. And it was really... <laughs> we all deflated a little bit as we watch her aspirate and her sat starts coming lower. And at the end of this vomiting episode, we have this lady with DKA and pneumonia and now a sat in the 70s. So now we have to intubate. You don't want to intubate these people if you can at all avoid it, but eventually, sometimes, you come to that moment where you must intubate them. So we intubated her uh, and that part went smoothly. The intubation itself wasn't difficult. The hard part now is setting the ventilator in a way that can manage her acid base status. And so the key here to remember is that your normal default settings will not be adequate for this lady. If you go with your normal settings, this lady will arrest typically within 60 seconds or so. So we need to make some changes to how we set the ventilator. And so your normal settings are inadequate because of how she's compensating for her metabolic acidosis. So we compensate with our respiratory status by taking huge breaths and really fast breaths. And when you look at these DKA patients from the end of the bed, they are taking giant breaths at a high rate, blowing off all that PCO2 to try to compensate for the low bicarb. And so when you're thinking about setting the vent, you need to match her minute ventilation. And what that means is, because we know minute ventilation is your tidal volume times your respirate, you need to figure out her tidal volume and figure out her respirate. So I don't normally calculate the respirate myself pretty much ever, except for these patients. If I am going to intubate somebody with severe metabolic acidosis, while the nurses are getting the meds ready and the RTs are getting their tube ready, I am standing at the end of the bed with my watch personally counting their respirate because I want to either match that rate or exceed it a little bit. And I'm thinking about their tidal volume. How big a person are they? 
Are they taking giant breaths and using all their intercostal muscles? Because these are people who may have a tidal volume up around 800, 900, 1,000 cc's. They are taking huge breaths at a high rate, and I need to at least match it, if not exceed it. So counting their respirate is essential, figuring out a high tidal volume, and this is the person where I will do a gas within a couple minutes of intubating them. Normally, I'm happy to wait 15, 20 minutes in somebody who's quite stable. In this person, I want to do gases early and often because those first few minutes are critical for managing their acid base status. So if our normal settings are like this, FiO2 50%, peeps of 5, tidal volumes of 6 to 8 cc's per kilo, respirate 12, and a decent flow, when we're setting somebody with severe metabolic acidosis, you're taking the tidal volume way up. These people are not getting lung protective ventilation anymore. You're starting them at 10 or 12 cc's per kilo, knowing that they are at risk of barotrauma. You may end up putting chest tubes in these people, but they need that huge tidal volume to compensate. And you're going high on their respirate. If their previous respirate was 25, I would start there. But I've also started at 30. I've started at 35. Uh, sometimes you need an incredibly high rate here because if you choose too low and you fail to compensate adequately, their pH and their acidosis is going to get worse, and that's what causes the PEA arrest. Do you have to adjust their flow to make up for how much air volume you're trying to get in because you're going higher volume at a faster respirate? rate? Does that automatically mean the flow is going to go up as well or yeah and often when you're setting that high a respirate they really have very short inspiratory times on the ventilator and so many vents will automatically increase their flow rate uh, on it depends which ventilator you have some you can manually adjust it but they will need a high flow to get through that many breaths because if you're setting a rate up at around 35 yeah uh, I mean these rates are hard to physically do on a vent you're essentially pushing the vent to its maximum limits to try to match what a young person can do on their own. So in that way, like humans are much better at breathing than vents are. Um, and humans can exceed the capacity of a vent. And so that's why these patients are so dangerous because we, we push the limits of what you can actually do with a vent. Is this a patient also where you may not want to have them have apneic respirations or like you may need to do a short acting paralytic to get them intubated, but after that you want to put them on a, hey, let you breathe as fast as your body tells you to breathe as opposed to me controlling that? Absolutely. So either a short term paralytic so they can take it back over on their own if they are awake enough and have enough of a drive to breathe. This is also the patient where I personally will not let them have an apneic period while I'm waiting for the paralytic to kick in. I will push their RSI and I will bag them throughout mm. at the rate that I'm going to set the vent on. Mm. I'll stop bagging to stick the tube in and then I set the vent immediately or go back to bagging while we're setting the vent. And that is my personal practice, uh, how experts to this varies. Um, but even knowing she's a high aspiration risk, I think her risk of dying from PEA is higher than her risk of dying from aspiration. So I would bag this lady. Comparing these two cases, like both of them definitely give me the pucker factor. But I think this one is just deserves a lot more attention because the COPD asthma one, when they're about to get intubated, like you are, everyone's locked and loaded because the person is creating a show. I mean, like they are like, so like in the moment, it's like you, everyone's afraid. Like this one, like I think is like a little bit more insidious because they are like actively trying to compensate. You just have to be attuned to the fact that they are trying to compensate for that severe metabolic acidosis. And yeah, obviously they're sick enough that you're about to intubate them, but this is the one where like, Oh man, like I, I love your model about how your initial vent settings are important, but even more so is how you're going to titrate it afterwards because that is the moment, like that's the peri, the peri uh, arrest kind of period you're trying to prevent. And so, full yeah, attention. I totally agree with you, Paul. And I think, I think there's something about the age, like young people breathing at 40 don't look that sick the way a 90 year old breathing at 40 looks. So a young person, if you have an 18 year old with DKA, they can actually look pretty good and you can miss how sick they are until you start counting their respirate and you're like, wait, they're breathing at 40. Yeah. I'm never gonna achieve this on my ventilator. 
Um, and so they can physiologically just look good. They're good protoplasm. Yeah. Is this also a patient then that you may want to try to avoid intubation if possible? Or do you are more of the mindset of like, look, you can't breathe at 40 forever. You're going to tire out. So I want to preemptively uh, intubate you and take control of your respirations. Because I know with asthmatics and COPD, is like, no, let's not intubate them if we don't have to. Let's, you know, do BiPAP or CPAP or whatever, because I want to avoid all those complications. And this one, can I have that same concept? Or like, I want to avoid intubating you, even though you're breathing at 40. I only really have to make that decision if you're aspirating or now you can't keep up with your breathing. Yeah, if you don't have to intubate them, don't. Because a young person can actually breathe at 40 for a while. And in the meantime, ideally, you're still doing your resuscitation and your medical management, which is going to help move their bicarb and make their respiratory workload easier. So I will not preemptively or electively intubate these people. I will uh, try to avoid it at all costs. And that's a tough one for new learners sometimes because both of those, right, the asthmatic, they look like they're having a hard time breathing. Them, they look like they're having a hard time breathing. Like, oh, I gotta support them. I'm gonna intubate them because I'm gonna. But that sometimes, well, a lot of times in these cases is probably the wrong answer. Absolutely, and that's why these are some of our special cases that we want to think about harder. If you know you've got a patient with severe metabolic acidosis, you want to think hard before you intubate that person because it's going to be tough to ventilate them. Awesome. Okay, and so this leads me, in fact. Nice job. Right into my next point. Well done, team. Uh, That you want to resuscitate these patients as much as possible before you intubate them. And if you can avoid intubating them altogether, even better. But even spending an extra five or 10 minutes can help move their pH and bicarb into a safer range. So if you don't have time, you may just have to go ahead and intubate. But if you have any wiggle room, spend it resuscitating them and trying to avoid that intubation because it'll help keep your patients safer. So bottom line here for the severe metabolic acidosis patient, please resuscitate them before you intubate. But then when you do have to intubate and you're setting the ventilator, match their minute ventilation. That means match their respiratory rate and match their tidal volume, if not exceeding it by a little bit. And do a gas early to make sure you're on the right track. Okay, so those were our two special scenarios uh, where we want to avoid those pitfalls in the emergency department. We're now going to talk through a basic approach to ventilator alarms. And so this approach has five steps, uh, which sounds daunting, but don't worry, uh, because the first four steps do not require any knowledge of vent alarms whatsoever. And step five is totally optional. Uh, So let's walk through this and you'll see how this works. So step one. When you hear the alarm go off in your emergency department, walk towards the alarm. This alone is gonna set you apart from everybody else in your department who rapidly like finds something to do elsewhere or is rapidly busy in some other area of the department. Uh, So it's a hero move just right there to walk towards the room because nobody else will be doing that. I love the picture selection because there are cobwebs over that alarm. (laughs) nobody goes near the alarms (laughs) man (laughs) all right step two once you're in the room and the alarm is going off please find the silence button and hit it not only will your colleagues thank you because everybody hates listening to those alarms but you help reduce how much it's annoying you which gives you back some of the cognitive bandwidth you need to work through this problem So step three then is there will be something red and flashing on your screen. No matter what vent you have, when there is an alarm, it flashes. This one says low VTE, although it's hard to see. You don't need to know what that means. You can probably just read the letters because I'm assuming everybody is an excellent reader if they're watching this. And so then on your phone call to the RT, you sound a lot smarter. You can say, hey, I've got a low VTE alarm. Even if you don't know what that means, you've just read it to them. And often over the phone, they can help you troubleshoot what to do next. Or you could even grab that moment of opportunity and say, hey, it's a low VTE alarm. What does that mean? And they're going to say, hey, it's low exhaled tidal volume. And they can help walk you through it, right? There's an opportunity for learning there if you're willing. But even if you're not willing, you can just read it out to them, which helps make their job easier. Why can't they just write low ETV instead of (laughs) ETV? You're totally right. Like, come on, guys. I know. 
But intensivists like to keep it yeah. confusing. It makes us feel special yeah. and smart. Job security. Yeah, job Crazy security forever. We'll just we'll make everything backwards. We'll see our people will we'll never We'll make get. everything backwards. And then when people start catching up, we'll just change the name of it to something new. <laughs> right. uh, and then they won't know what we're talking about anymore. Just add more circles and numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, end title volume is ETV, not VTE, but whatever. We'll, we'll move on. Well, like on it. some fans, it's going to be VTE. Right. And then right. inhaled is going to be VTI. Yeah. And no. there you I go. I like it. Like All it. right, so step three is you're reading what is red and flashing. This brings us to step four. Step four is the critical moment here where you still don't know what that alarm means, but you are now standing in the room with your patient and you are a smart, educated healthcare provider who can probably do some easy stuff at the bedside. So say the patient's uh, endotracheal tube has become disconnected from the vent tubing, you could Stick the two ends together and reconnect them. Easy win. I like that. Easy win, <laughs> right? You could say, oh, look, the tubing is kinked in the bed rail. Somebody put the bed rail down. I'm going to lift that up and fix the kink. Uh, I'd say check that before you call your RT because you don't want to be the guy with RT <laughs> oh. shows up like, oh, well, you just had to do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you a story in a minute. I'll tell you my embarrassing story. But it's happened me... to all of us. Oh, yeah. We've, we've all, <laughs> yeah, and, right? And that's what we'll share with the listeners, that we yeah. all have one of these embarrassing <laughs> stories. Mine's it's horrible. Like, oh, oh, um, oh. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you in a second. Say you see secretions pouring out of their mouth or their endotracheal tube. You could stick a suction catheter down and suction that. You could say, hey, that sat's low and dial up their FiO2. You could see that they're coughing, they're bucking, they're awake. Hey, I need to give them some sedation. That's going to take your order anyway, so you can enter that order and get that done. Sometimes the patients just come back from CAT scan and nobody plugged the vent back in, and it's alarming because it's low battery, and then you can do the hero move of plugging it back in. Or maybe just maybe they've self-extubated and they need you to put the tube back in. What I'm trying to express here is that there are all sorts of easy wins that you can have at the bedside without knowing anything about the vent alarm. That just having you in the room is value add for managing this patient in a whole variety of situations. And so, I'll, do you want to hear my embarrassing yes. story? I'll mm -hmm. tell you my, I'll tell you my embarrassing story. So I was a PGY two, which is a second year emergency medicine resident, at my hospital in Toronto and I had intubated this patient. It had gone really well. I was very proud of myself and we had set the vent and we were waiting for an ICU bed. So the patient was still in the emergency department and the vent alarm starts going off and I know nothing about vent alarm. So I immediately became very busy somewhere else because that was important. I didn't go in the room and we called the RT. <laughs> like eventually it'll stop alarming <laughs> when the battery dies. And it, well, and in fact, not only did I not go in the room, nobody went in the room. So I felt, in fact, I was in tune with my colleagues Alarm at, fatigue, at yeah. that stage. We were all avoiding. No, I think none of us knew what to do. Oh, I think we okay. were all actively avoiding that alarm, in fact. Yes. This, this story gets, I, it's so embarrassing. So we called the RT to come down to the emergency department. And so the RT has to leave the maternity ward where they are assisting with a delivery and they're about to have a neonate they're supposed to resuscitate to come downstairs. And she comes downstairs and she goes in the room. And I still remember it so vividly. Like I know where I was standing on this day. I know what room it was in my department. And she comes out of the room and she's like, Sarah, c come in here for a second. And I'm like, okay. So I, so I walk into the room and my patient had been a patient who took a drug overdose and they had self extubated. So the vent was alarming, but the patient was fine. Normal vitals, good sat, like they were just awake enough now that they didn't need to be intubated anymore. Perfect vitals, waking up, he was like, hey, can I have a home. sandwich? And I just, just stood there horrified because I had called the RT away from this delivery, away from resuscitating a neonate uh, to come down totally uselessly, essentially to turn the vent off, which if I had just been brave enough to walk into the room, um, I could have managed that. All right. Discharge and the patient. Discharge, I, and then I got to discharge the patient home, and I'm still horrified. It, that was a long time ago now, and I'm still I, I'm blushing. That's all right. Yeah. There's nothing like a little embarrassment to really strive you to do better and and uh, learn about vents, which right? clearly you've done. Yeah, and then I went on. I did a critical care fellowship. Yeah. I was like, I need to fix this. I've definitely been there as well. So. <laughs> right, I'm not alone. Yeah. I think I'm not alone, but. All of you clever half listeners. Half the battle is showing up, like you said. Half the battle is showing up, just walking into the room. That's a huge step. Yep. All right. 
For all of the keeners out there, if you want to take this to the next level, step five is for you, where we start giving you an approach to the actual alarms. And I'm just going to run you through our two most common alarms. So high pressure is an extremely frequent alarm in the emergency department. And I use the mnemonic DOPE uh, to run through an algorithm for this. Do you guys use DOPE? Do you know what that stands for? I remember learning it, but I'm not a mnemonic guy like Paul is. So, Paul, I mean, this looks like right up your alley. Let's go through it. <laughs> okay, let's walk through it, right? We can all learn together. So D stands for displaced. Has your endotracheal tube been dislodged? Is it in the right main stem? Check to make sure that it's at the appropriate depth. O is for obstructed. Is your tube blocked by secretions or a mucus plug, or is it kinked in some way? The easiest way to check for this is to just fire a suction catheter down there and make sure it passes smoothly all the way to the bottom and then back up. Is there a pneumothorax? So this is an opportunity to pull out your ultrasound or your chest x-ray, your stethoscope uh, to check for pneumothorax. And then equipment failure, which is, is the vent itself not working? So this does take us back to the critical step of, if you just can't get the vent to stop alarming, just take the patient off the vent and bag, right? This is always our safe backup move whenever the vent is driving you crazy. If you need to just turn it off, turn it off. It will be safe to bag your patient until someone comes to bail you out. But this is a quick and easy mnemonic to use to run through that high pressure alarm. Love it. Love it. Next low pressure alarms. And these will come up on some vents as low pressure. Sometimes they come up as low volume, but the concept is the same. There's typically a leak in the breathing circuit. Like there's a hole in the tubing somewhere between the patient and the ventilator. Maybe there's a hole in the endotracheal tube, most commonly because the patient has bit through it. Uh, or they may have self extubated, which is the biggest leak of all. Now, in rare circumstances, you can have med gas failure. And what I mean by this is like in your hospital, the medical gas in the walls can stop flowing. You usually know this because it's a form of internal disaster and often they'll call a code um, overhead notifying people that this has happened. So this is usually not a surprise. And this also, you can have a total failure of your vent where again, you would just take the patient off and bag. But low pressure alarm is a leak until proven otherwise. So if you're seeing that flashing at the bedside, you can examine the tubing in the endotracheal tube to make sure you, there isn't a hole or in fact, to find the hole and then plug it. So basic approach to alarms. Step one is walk towards the alarm. Step two is when you're in the room, silence it so you can think. Step three is to read the alarm. So you can tell your RT or you can learn about it. Step four is then to fix the easy stuff. Do all of the stuff that's obvious at the bedside that would help your patient. And step five is to remember your algorithms for your high pressure alarms and your low pressure alarms. So in summary, I want you to remember those two special circumstances. The COPD patient who has a PA arrest around the time of your intubation. You're thinking about dynamic hyperinflation. You're thinking about hypovolemia. You're thinking about pneumothorax. Those have to be assessed for all of these arrests. Next, metabolic acidosis. Try to not intubate these patients if you don't have to. But when you have to, be very careful to match their respiratory rate and their tidal volume count their rate yourself and either meet it or exceed it a little bit because these patients are extremely high risk and then vent alarms easy thanks awesome, awesome. thanks sarah